have had the opportunity to uh, to uh, participate in this project and actually be on the boat uh, once. So uh, I can give you some firsthand uh, experience uh, of, uh, of working on this on one of these boats. And I have to tell you, it's it's a hoot. And these are uh, these are, I think, if I recall right, something like a twelve million dollar of uh, carbon fiber and titanium uh, 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 racing sailboats. Uh, this one is owned by um, a executive for a, a very large company whose name you would recognize immediately if I could share it with you. It was uh, built in, uh, in um, the south of uh, Spain. Uh, and let's see, like I said, they are, it's, if you ever get a chance to, to ride on one of these, I couldn't recommend it more highly. Uh, there's a crew of like uh, 25 men, roughly, that that run this thing. And, you know, in the old days, of course, all the men would uh, would crank the winches and everything by hand. Well, that you can't possibly do that with these uh, with these boats. So the the, uh, the all the winches and everything that run the sailboat are all uh, are all uh, run by hydraulics now. And Marine Hydraulics has developed the control system for all those, as well the control system as well as all the physical hydraulic systems uh, for those for those boats. Talk a little bit about the company. So it was founded in 2012. Uh, they design hydraulic systems for uh, racing sailboats, super yachts. Uh, they're based up in uh, beautiful Polesboro, Washington, which is a little bit. Uh, west of Seattle. I didn't realize there was a west of Seattle until I uh, had a chance to visit their facility. Uh, they do all their own custom hydraulics, uh, all their own uh, valving, uh, and their systems are all based on the CAN bus. This is kind of the heart of the system. This is the hydraulic power unit. Uh, it's got the custom tank and uh, modular components. This is a really interesting, this is a, a manifold that they manufacture themselves. It's designed to be uh, uh, very responsive and um, very lightweight, which is something I should have added. You know, obviously these sailboats, they try to you know, save every gram they can, hence the reason they use a lot of carbon fiber and titanium. And so the control system has to match, has to have that same goal. So they, uh, they've custom designed these manifolds and they manufacture those right up there in, in Paulsboro, very fast and, uh, and very light. Uh, they use the, uh, um, these uh, IO modules, which are CAN IO modules, which are also uh, very lightweight and uh, durable, which again is a requirement on a sailboat. Uh, they have uh, winches, furlers. Well, here, we'll just go through because the, uh, these slides go through each one of these uh, individually. So if any of you familiar with uh, sailing, you know, everybody needs winches. You've got to pull those lines in uh, and let them out uh, slowly. So they wrap these, uh, the lines they call around these uh, winches. And then there's some buttons there. And let me turn on my laser pointer so I can point this out a little bit. So they got some uh, the buttons on each one of these, and there's also some uh, uh, deck switches here. So and a lot of times, their sailors' uh, hands are 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 busy, so they use a foot switches here instead, or they have these uh, also uh, uh, these membrane panels that have uh, custom back back lighting on them, also for sailing at at night. Um, yeah, these these buttons we'll show you a little bit later. They're in software control. You you, you touch it once and it, it starts to furl in slowly or winch in slowly. Uh, touch it again, it starts going in faster, and you touch and hold it. I, and I forget all the exact functions, but there's a, a complicated state machine that goes with these uh, uh, with these buttons, and also a, a several different choices of how those buttons work. I think that's covered a little bit later. 
Uh, they, they have uh, also captive winches, which is more like a, a cylinder like this. They can wrap it around in this thing it's, and it will spin in and out at uh, a variable speed. Uh, they have furlers, which are used to pull in the, uh, uh, the jib or the, uh, I think that's a jib or is it the spinnaker? My, my control system knowledge uh, is, is, is better than my sailing knowledge, I'll just put it that way. Uh, these are also variable speed. They can be uh, controlled by push buttons or with a joystick to furl them in and out at the variable speed. Uh, the tensioner holds down the, uh, uh, the, the sail. So that's for uh, you know, providing some, I believe that's for providing some, uh, some uh, uh, angle on the sail. Uh, tensioners are run by cylinders, which is a, another hydraulic um, a device. So here we have the, uh, we're showing a cylinder that can be pulled in under hydraulic force or pushed out under hydraulic force. Uh, some of those have position indicators, which is a little, you know, you can just barely see this uh, little line here that goes to a, a small uh, a variable potentiometer that spins in and out uh, to measure the exact distance of that. Uh, a hydraulic cylinder. And let's see, yeah, this boom vang here, this is another hydraulic uh, object. So this actually pulls down the boom and uh, the, um, so the, you know, the, then tightens the sail. So the faster they sail, the, the, tight, the tighter the sail will be. And on the back of the boat, there's a, a traveler that moves the boom, the back of the boom back and forth. Um, the, optimize the angle of the sail with respect to the uh, wind and the direction of the boat. And we have a windlass here. Yeah, this has a little video with it. This is for pulling in the, uh, pulling in the anchor or letting out the anchor. And the kite hosting, kite hoisting, kite, uh, I think, I think that's synonymous with spinnaker. There, there may be some subtle difference, but uh, it's the big, huge, you know, when they're trying to travel with the wind, downwind, uh, they'll put out the big spinnaker to try to grab as much wind as they possibly can. Uh, when you're sailing, the object is to get that thing up and down as quickly as conceivably possible. So here we've got, uh, so this has a, uh, it's, it, uh, just a regular winch for, for pulling it up. It's very fast. I got to get it started here. Then in a minute, you'll see that it, uh, and see there's, you press that little button in the middle that, uh, of the winch that varies the speed. So now it comes up really fast. And then the next one is more interesting because getting it down is apparently even more important. And so what they, what they have here is they have uh, a system that just grabs that sail that now we're looking underneath the boat inside the hull. And uh, when they, uh, uh, when it's time to bring that kite down, they get it down that much. And then they, then they hit this button and the thing just gets, gets pulled in here. Uh, oh, here's that, that's the top view. The bottom view is more interesting. You don't wanna be down there when this is happening. They say, heads up, get out of the way because this thing's coming in fast. Uh, they got a, a broad team of talent. Uh, several of the programmers uh, have a IT background. Uh, a couple have an OT background. Uh, that would be me. They brought me in to uh, to help them out get started on the on the right foot. Uh, and so they use uh, object oriented design uh, for reusability, which we'll talk about a little bit more on that. Um, and they have a uh, they uh, have simulations, so they have unit test simulations. So for each of the individual modules, have has a small unit test, and potent, and oftentimes has its own little uh, HMI screen. Uh, so for instance, when the uh, uh, so in like for that winch, the winch has a, uh, a torque feedback, uh, and so. The, they have a simulation component that simulates the torque feedback. So they can say, okay, you're, you're pulling, this thing is pulling on a really uh, a high, high torque uh, load. 
uh, or low, you know, so that's, during the simulation, they can vary the load. Uh, and then that component will, um, you know, feedback the appropriate amount of torque, depending on what kind of load they've set for that. Uh, and then they can verify that the, the control system is behaving properly for that, for that load. Uh, they also have a the full full physical setup in their shop, so they perform everything tested all before they ship it, uh, typically overseas to uh, for the installation. Uh, so this was the 90 foot carbon fiber fiber uh, catamaran. Okay, that's not what we saw earlier. That was a single hull, but the, since then they've done a, a, a catamaran sailboat. I'm still waiting for my ride on that one, Andy. <clears throat> Uh, it's got uh, all the features that we talked about earlier. Uh, they use Coatsys for their uh, uh, their visual interface. They've got at least a couple of screens um, that shows them all the uh, status of everything and all the settings that the uh, the uh, users can set, like how how fast the winches you know the winches run at their. Remember, I told you there were several speeds that they could select. Uh, all the configuration is all done in these uh, configuration screens. The code is uh, uh, uses CFC for most of the top levels. Uh, CFC is a great language for building your block diagrams. And this is basically what they've done, a block diagram that matches the, uh, the uh, design of the, the ship itself, the control center for the, the physical design. We'll talk about that more. Uh, they use uh, structure text for the calculations and logics, as well as some uh, block-based CFC for the actual, uh, 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 you know, the actual code that, uh, the operating code, and uh, a little bit of SFC. Not a lot of state machines in this, but uh, when there is, they use uh, they use some SFC, and they use a technique uh, with a CSV file for. Uh, for uh, persisting all that data, all the settings and so forth, and you know, the, so they can, uh, uh, you know, and and the configuration for everything. I think we talk about that a little bit later on. So the system uses uh, object-oriented uh, designs. So this is the this is the top level. So we have uh, some uh, CAN masters. We've got an alarm uh, central service. We've got a page of cylinders, a page of uh, hydraulics, uh, some lighting, some sails. So each of these are, are function blocks uh, that uh, are instantiated in this top level design. And the reason they chose to do CFC is because I mean, it's, this is basically the same thing. Each one of these components uh, uh, corresponds to one or more objects uh, on, on the boat. And it's just very easy. They can just double click on this. And let's see, on the main sheet system, they double click on that. Uh, and they, uh, let's see, that brings up the next page, which is again, very simple. So they've made a, a you know, hierarchical design of very simple building blocks. Simple building blocks are you know, much easier to design, much easier to uh, test, much easier to maintain and are much more reusable. They can easily reuse these on the next boat or the next boat. So it's made up of a lot of, uh, of a, a hierarchical design of a number of simple building blocks. And the, you know, it shows the connectivity here. So we've got a dump control, which again, this is a function block, which may or may not have multiple additional layers of hierarchy uh, below it, uh, connected to uh, the main sheet and the, the traveler. Uh, and then we've got the next page is the, uh, the windless system. So this has a little bit more uh, uh, functionality. This one has actually the a valve system, a uh, PD uh, pulse width modulator driver. The button controller, remember I told you about that. Uh, so if we were able to push into this, uh, we would see, uh, and this one, I think there's four or five, three or four different um, uh, um, uh, ways for the buttons to work. And so that's several different uh, uh, SFCs that are put together and can be selected to which technique they want to be able to want to use for that particular button. And then they've got, uh, so, you know, the CFC, and then once it gets down into the code that's actually implemented, and some of that's done in structured text, some of that's done in, uh, uh, in this case, this is a block based uh, CFC. 
So this is just like function block diagram, except it's a little more flexible when you use it uh, when you, in CFC. It's a kind of a superset of function block diagram. Uh, the uh, and I know Andy wanted to talk about how his he his background is uh, you know in in Java and C plus plus and his expectation was when he took this job that he was going to code everything in structured text because that's was what what he was used to the uh, uh, the uh, uh, engineer from whom he took over uh, had done a lot of the designs in block based uh, CFC design. And uh, it, it, uh, it, and I have to admit also, uh, my, my background is more uh, text-based uh, tools as well, uh, but we both kind of uh, really liked what we saw here, made it so much easier to understand and maintain, and you know, anybody could understand it. You know, uh, we could give this to a, uh, you know, a technician and he would be able to understand, or she would be able to understand what's going on. Uh, more than uh, uh, would possibly po you know, in structured text. But structured text has its place. There's many things that don't fit well in a graphic language. Uh, and you know, the button combiner is one of them. You know, a lot of if thens or iterations uh, are best designed in structured text. And so that's what, uh, what Andy has done here. Uh, well, here's the SFC, now, this is a simple one. So just you push push the button the first time, and then you're in this state, and then you let go of the button. Uh, uh, you either push it for a certain amount of time. Uh, I'm sorry, that would be over here. Push and hold. You go to the push and hold state, or if you push and let go before the timeout, you go to the first release state, uh, and then when uh, yeah, and then when you time out from there, uh, you go back to to idle. Uh, yeah, e, so that is push the button, let go of the button. Well, if you push it again, then you go to the second push. And then each one of these has uh, entry actions, which uh, control the outputs. And unfortunately, we, we uh, I can't, you know, if this were live, I could double click on this E and you could see what the, the action is, which is just basically it's uh, setting the uh, discrete outputs to that particular valve, or telling it, you know, I, I don't recall now, I thought, I think there's two outputs uh, for this valve for the four different states off, uh, low, medium, and high. I think those are coded into two discrete outputs. So if you were to see these, you'd see each one of these entry actions sets the, um, those two outputs uh, that appropriately for this state that you're in. So uh, Andy used uh, a lot of uh, folders to try to keep this code well organized. You'll see each one we have output devices. Within that, we have PWM drivers and I drivers. Uh, within that, we have the uh, the function block for that driver, and it has a bunch of its own methods uh, for uh, the central services. In this case, these are the uh, methods for the uh, configuration central service. That's the one that does all the reading and writing to and from the CSV file. Uh, they have an oil user uh, central service. So this thing, uh, the engine needs to know how fast it needs to be running. Uh, and so every time that a uh, hydraulic user is, is uh, uh, commanded to run, uh, it sends a uh, oil need to uh, back to this oil central service. And that then tells the engine to uh, speed up or, or slow down as the, as the demand rises or, or, or falls. And that's all done in the, uh, this oil user central service. Um, yep, and then also they keep the uh, visualizations also. Some of these visualizations might be for testing Otherwise, they are the objects that correspond to this. And I, I, you know, if you're not familiar with object-oriented visualization, uh, actually, I'll, I'll talk about that on Friday. Uh, so you, in CodeSys, you can make a visualization block that corresponds to a function block. Uh, so uh, so uh, 
uh, and then you can instantiate that visualization into a master visualization and then just tie it to that function block. So in a, you know, on one of their typical boats, they're gonna have 20 or so of these uh, function blocks instantiated. And then they will have, I don't know which one is, the, is the, the one that actually corresponds to that, but somewhere in their visualization, they will have 20 of those visualizations instantiated into a top level visualization. And each one of those 20 visualizations will be tied to its corresponding instance of this function block. So it's really slick. Uh, tune in on uh, Friday and I'll show you a little bit more detail. They have chosen uh, to do something that is rather unique. Uh, okay, then let me, let me talk about this first. So they have uh, these uh, control visualizations for each uh, object. In this case, we have some for the, the thrusters. There, and again, these are objects that are instantiated. So here we've got, uh, well, two of them. So, so each, so this um, uh, uh, visualization is for a thruster. They've instantiated two of those, one, two. Uh, and these, again, are tied back to two instances of the uh, thruster function blocks. Yep. And a lot of these uh, items are all configurable. So you can uh, set up your thrusters the way you want them. All that data gets written back to that uh, uh, CSV file that we talked about earlier, that central service. The, uh, the, so anytime that they make a change to a visualization, they call the central service and say, uh, take me a new snapshot of all the settings uh, and it will record all the, the new settings that have, that have changed. And so they stay persistent that way. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there's the uh, individual thruster panel. They're also using, um, okay, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what, uh, what Andy wanted to say about this one. I know they're using, yeah, all right, so the evolution of the hydraulics. So this is actually, uh, well, okay, so this shows how, uh, I believe originally this was the, uh, was the hydraulic system uh, slowly, this, uh, so um, more and more features were added and this thing began to grow. And, uh, and oh, by the way, the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the lines didn't route here quite right, something codes this could, could definitely improve on. But one way around this is to don't make them this complicated. I mean, that's the whole, the whole object of you know, trying to keep you know, abstraction is trying to keep things uh, simple at each level and with consistent level of detail at each level. Well, this has, you know, this has functionality uh, as well as instantiating uh, blocks. So this is, this is like combined uh, block diagram and block-based design, which is usually not a, not a good idea. You, know, you really wanna keep things at your top level, you wanna keep them you know, a block diagram. And then as you descend further into the hierarchy, then that's where you wanna see more and more of the, the detail, the functionality. Well, this one kind of evolved. Uh, it started out with block-based and then additional functionality got added and it was, uh, it was added right here at this level, which, uh, you know, when you're uh, when you're uh, have a deadline and a bunch of sailors are standing around uh, waiting for you, you know that's how you gotta you do things. But when you get home and uh, the pressure's off, uh, you can go back and redesign, which is what they did. Uh, and now it looks like this much much uh, cleaner and easier to understand, and uh, and much more reusable. All right, uh, marine hydraulics did something very uh, unusual, at least in, in my experience. Uh, they have created um, uh, these visualization pages. Uh, let me show you, uh, let's see. Uh, so they, they've created these standard IO system blocks that match the actual physical block. So again, you know, it's a, 
They've, they've taken this one-to-one -one correspondence between the physical design and the control design uh, by in, into the IO uh, as well. So they've got function blocks that are, are, are associated with each type of IO module. And then they instantiate, they create, declare instances of those function blocks for each physical IO module of that type. And uh, each one has a test page. And let me show you that because it's kind of cool. So this is uh, the test page for each IO module. And it looks just like the IO module. And everything, the lights are just like the IO module. And everything that's on that I, all the, all the uh, displays and everything that's in that, uh, in that IO module shows up here. So they could either go to this, you know, this, the, the, this, this uh, screen and look at the, uh, uh, look at the status of the IO module, or they could, you know, go down into the hull and look down there at it. And it's going to be this identical information. They also have a, it set up so that it tells them for each instance now uh, exactly what each IO module, uh, each IO point is for. The description over here. And then they can also, uh, they can take this, uh, uh, disable the inputs and override the inputs uh, on each one of these individually as well, right from the screen, if uh, a sensor's not working or something, or they, and, uh, and they can also uh, uh, disconnect the program input also. So either way, they can override the input or the output uh, right here from this, from the screen. So like I said, uh, so this is a visualization block uh, frame sometimes it's sometimes called uh, and then there's one of these that are instantiated in a visualization for each uh, instance of that IO module so again you've got you know uh, this is a CR 2016 this one happens to be module one we can sort of see that up here so you know say they've got 20 of these IO modules so they would be 20 they would have declared 20 instances of that uh, CR2016 function block. In a visualization, they would have 20 of these pages, uh, which are each one of those is tied back to each instance of that function block. You know, so it's, and you know, so all they need to do when they uh, add another IO module, they just instantiate another IO module function block, uh, put another one of these visualizations screens into their visualization, tie the two together and boom, they're done. And, and then all the rest of this is just done through the configuration CSV file, which we'll, we'll see in a moment. Uh, let's see, you got CAN status for every IO modules. Yep, this is all for, uh, for overriding. Uh, and this is, uh, this is, oh, this is an uh, override for a, sorry, I don't remember what that one is for. All right, now um, they, uh, so well, the way they do this now, so the traditional CODSYS IO mapping is all this is, is it's mapped to a single function block. Uh, so here we've got module zero. So each one of these, so these, this mapping never changes except the module number. That's the only thing that changes. Otherwise this mapping is, is, is fixed. So you know when they create when they add a new another I/O module, they just copy this page, and they do have to go through and do a global search and replace on that module number. But otherwise, so this this is always this I/O is always connected to uh, a function block that has all these matching uh, fixed. So th these are fixed for this type of uh, I/O module. Uh, and then they use, uh, then in that IO module, now this is what they currently do. This is uh, something that they're hoping to uh, improve in the future. But then from that function block, then they distribute the IO from that out to where the, the objects where the IO is connected to. Uh, now I know that they, let's see, I think we cover this later, but as long as we're on this slide, so this, these two steps, I think, are like the last vestiges of flat programming that they have not been able to get, to get rid of yet or haven't had the time to, to improve yet. Uh, you know, in the, in the flat space, of course, you know, you know, we always used to have big 
big glo global variable list with lots of variables in it. And so here, you know, we would, you know, if we wanted to add IO, we would have to go to our global variable list, copy the section, paste it at the end, rename all those uh, global variables. We'd come into here, rename all these to match those global variables. And then we'd go to the, uh, the object, the winch or wherever those, those, those values go to and make a copy of that and rename all its global variables, right? Uh, so they've, uh, and then the same thing with all the configuration parameters for all those. Well, they've, um, they've been able to make everything object-based uh, for all those, ex except this is the last step that they have not been able to, to make uh, object-based quite yet. Uh, ultimately, what, what they will plan to do is, um, is make this all configurable as well. And so what will happen now is they, they won't use the CodeSys IO mapping at all. Instead, now the function block itself will query the IO module directly. It will get the data directly from that IO module. And then it will then distribute the IO out to the objects where they need to be connected. And that will all again be done in that same uh, CSV file, which I hope we have a picture of. And then this, this step will, will completely go away. Well, they won't need that at all. So I think we talk about that. So here's the CSV file. Uh, so what this does is, so we have a, um, a structure. So every object, a winch or a pump driver in this case has a structure uh, and it has all the configurable parameters for that, how fast it ramps up, how fast it ramps down, what it's minimum current and maximum current, flow demand, so forth, this, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then there's a, it, and this would be instantiated, this, uh, yeah, the structure is instantiated inside this function block. And then that is all configured through this configuration file. And this configuration file is set up, it's all grouped. So every row is an instance of this function block. Um, so these, so this is a CSV file is first it's grouped by function block type. So here's the section for this function block type. And then the section here, and then each line, each row is an instance of this function block type. So this is, uh, so we have the windless valve. So, so, so somewhere in this, uh, application, there's a declaration line that says, uh, Let's see, yeah, va uh, it says, um, yeah, it says anchor windless colon CR2031 underscore PWMI driver semicolon. So these are each declarations, these are each instances of this function block, okay? And then these are all, these are the variables that are common to that function block. Uh, so this is, so you'll see here, these match. So each column now is a setting for that instance. It comes from here. So when you're online, you know, the, the thing that this, the first thing that happens when they power up is this CSV file gets read. Uh, it finds out, uh, yeah, it looks, it says, okay, I've got this windless uh, valve. What are my settings? It reads a file and then distributes those settings out to each object. The code sys also uses the, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, marine hydraulics also uses the code sys alarm management system. Uh, it's built on top of code sys. Now, the CODESYS alarm management system is again, it was designed for the older days. It's a, you know, before object oriented programming was created, it's more of a flat tool. The marine hydraulics has come up with a cool technique and I have to admit, I don't completely understand it. So all I can tell you is that it's, that it's, it's they did a very great job and they have somehow made this more object oriented. So instead of, you know, we, you know, in the old days we would complete our design 
uh, our control design, and then we would install the alarm manager, and then we would go and we'd ha have to tell the alarm manager, okay, go look for this this tag and alarm when it gets to this point. Look at this tag and alarm when it goes true and so forth, right? So it's like a post process that we had to do after we were done with our design. They don't do that now. They these is, All that information is embedded inside each object. So the winch knows everything it needs to know about alarming. And then it tells this the alarms and, uh, same, and the same thing with the visualization. The visualization for that winch it knows everything it needs to know about alarming for that winch. And so all they have to do is, again, when they want to add a winch, they you know, create a new instance of it. They declare an inst another instance of that winch. And then in the visualization, they tell it, yep, here's a, here's a um, uh, you know, we've, we've put in a new winch. And then it all takes care of all the new alarming for that winch. You don't need to go to this, um, uh, alarm list and you don't need to add anything to the alarm list or for or worse yet forget to add something to the alarm list it all happens uh, automatically so yep so the alarm so it's this is this is part of the system uh, that accomplishes that All right. Yep, we talked about the simulation mode. So every I/O module, you can have a simulation mode, which disables its in inputs and outputs. Uh, and also, each unit test has its own uh, simulation mode. So you can tell it, "No, I'm. You're no longer connected to the real world. You are now connected to this uh, this simulation the simulator of the real world." And it's just another function block that's instantiated this the simulator for the real world. Uh, and so they can take it offline and test it and put it back online. Um, so they've been, so I, I, and I wish Andy were on, I don't know exactly, I know they've done dozens of boats since they first uh, began this, using this technique. And they, they keep a list, what they call it their, um, technical debt list and they you know this this is things that yes we we want to do this obviously we cannot stop production uh you know and to spend a year to do this uh but we want to as we slowly go we want to continue to improve our systems you know ultimately someday you just want to get to the point where where uh designing the control system for the boat is as easy as writing the bill of material for the boat you know you got 10 winches okay we're putting 10 in our control system and it does everything for you um uh you're not quite there yet but uh, on every project they whittle a little, whittle away a little more of it at a time that's what they call that retiring their their technical debt uh, they're able to reuse the code as you know as these objects become more and more uh uh what's the word for it uh, configurable or flexible uh the it's it's easier to use this on more projects you know as they add you know more features uh, they have ultimately get to the point where the function block covers all the features that uh, you know, any boat that they would be installing it on would need. Uh, and then that becomes a truly reusable object. And they're very happy with that technique so far. Yeah, they got a, they got a great team. Uh, I'm sure Andy would have been able to tell you more about this, but they were a, an absolute pleasure to work with. Uh, takeaways, yep. So the expectation was, uh, you know, Andy came from the IT side, so he was expecting to uh, to work in structured text, uh, but uh, discovered that uh, the power of the graphical languages and uh, and you know when where each language is best applied, uh, and has adopted that as well as the rest of the team. Um, Yep, they use a different each language for where it's best applied. They're using the object-oriented industrial programming 
techniques, which if you want to learn more about that, uh, I'll be doing a tech talk on that on Friday. It's actually uh, the chapter out of my training uh, on that. And uh, Andy hopes that you are inspired to give it a try. Now, I see a whole bunch of uh, questions here. Let's see. So what are we using for unit testing? So the unit testing is, uh, it's, um, uh, and it's not, it's not automated unit testing per se. Unit testing consists of basically a digital twin of the, uh, the system, the sales, or the, uh, uh, you know, I think I, I mentioned this before that, so, you know, primarily the feedback that they're getting is the torque. Uh, how much torque it's taking to to move that, and then uh, based on the torque, the control system will sw switch gears. Uh, so these winches have a have a gear set in it. Have a, each winch has a transmission in it, basically, and uh, that transmission can switch that winch into you know high, high speed, low torque, uh, medium and medium, and uh, a low speed and high torque. Uh, and so it's based on the uh, oil pressure, the hydraulic um, pressure that's coming back, the feedback from the hydraulic pressure determines, um, you know, it tells the control system what to do. And so their digital twin is basically that system that's some, some mathematics, I think it's done in structured text that, uh, so, you know, if we're put, putting a lot of torque, okay, this is how your, uh, you know, your flow versus torque uh, calculation should be and what torque you should feed back. Uh, and then there's an HMI screen. So the operator can, you know, you can, you can, uh, you know, push the button, you can see what's happening. Uh, in that HMI screen, you can say, okay, there's a, there's a slider that says, okay, how does the system behave when I put a lot of torque on? Or how does it be uh, load? I'm sorry, a lot of load. How does it behave when I put less load on? And things like that. So it's, 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 it's manually done. Uh, and it's just basically, and there's a test procedure in their specifications. They have a test procedure. It's the same test procedure that they would do out in the field. Uh, and they just, but they do it in the lab. Okay, so we're gonna put a lot of torque on this winch. We're gonna uh, change, press this button once. It's gonna behave like this. And that's how they do it. Hope I answered that question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. The uh, poorly routed CFC. Uh, I know there's an, uh, there's enhancement request in there for them to fix that or better yet, or in the interim, I'm hoping that they'll less, at least let us route them manually uh, and fix, fix the routing I know, and fix it meaning uh, make it permanent. So I don't know why that happens. Uh, uh, in complicated CFCs, yeah, you open it up the next day and all of a sudden the routes that you had are now straight lines. Uh, you know, CodeSys is always continually improving their product. Is agile methodology used in the development? How do they keep track of the technical uh, JIRA and Git? Yeah, I think they're using, um, uh, I don't know that level of detail. I do know that they're using subversion, the, the subversion integration. Uh, man manual based testing yes that's that's what it is yeah it's not automated that's uh, it's it's basically yeah it's just the the factory acceptance test except they do it in in the shop instead of out in the field do it in in at their desks the same thing that they'll do when they get out to the field he would like to go to jira um if we have it ready and implemented um in the middle of the year ah very good all right, so I'm, this is the only questions I'm seeing, Chris. Are there any more questions? I've got this other thing blinking at me. Uh, no, uh, what I would like to show the uh, additional supplement sites from Andy, just uh, from the uh, visualizations, I was so impressed. It's, it's, we are talking about the sailing boat, not a big factory. And, and it, it, it's, uh, uh, they, they have such an impressive uh, programming style and visualization style. And if you look to all uh, their visualization, uh, you, you have a fantastic maintenance and service. You see the status of, of every CAN bus device. 
you can uh, look to any uh, winch and uh, and uh, I was very very impressed from the uh, uh, Gary's uh, explanation that uh, also the visualization is included and the uh, the messaging is included in the function blocks of the winch uh, and the main uh, sheets. Uh, it, it's uh, sad that Andy is not here to really uh, show these um, and explain uh, these uh, uh, visualization and these um, these things, but uh, it's an absolutely uh, uh, impressive um, visualization and uh, uh, project. 